Welcome to the second half of the episode with Carolina Trella. She's a PhD student at the University of Kent, investigating the psychosociological barriers to collective actions against climate change. In the first part, we talked about collective versus individual action, media's position in the narrative about climate change, and the effects on the people who feel more guilty and anxious. I'm Asia, and you're listening to Rethinking Climate. We try to open conversations with experts about complex and overlooked climate issues to make them more personal and accessible. We investigate how the climate crisis is spoken about. For the second part of the episode, we're going to talk about individual action, consumer choice, and conspiracy theories. So, Carolina, do you think that we should not only teach climate science in schools? but also the life cycle of a product that it's bought? It's really important to, well, to int- introduce children and young adults to uh, what, what, what system they're fostering, right? Because if, if you live in this system, you need to understand it, you need to be mindful of it. And y- in order for you to feel like you can have some power in it and to influence it, you need to understand how it works, right? And, and very few people have that knowledge because you need a university education on that specific thing, which is incredibly difficult. Um, so it's, it's just ridiculous that there isn't, this information is not something that people have on their fingertips. And this is the reason why conspiracy theories are created, or one of the reasons why. And it's because of the distrust of the media and of the government and of the, of the businesses and so on, because you don't have enough information yourself and you don't feel like you know what's going on, actually. And so you feel constantly manipulated by an entity that tells you what to do, what to buy, who to be, what to think, right? Yeah. And do you think it would help then if people knew everything? Not necessarily, actually. No. Well, I have, of course, my personal opinion is that there should be no economic system that fosters this kind of mentality. And I think I made that clear. But I honestly, my biggest issue with the, with this whole thing is that people don't know what they're doing. It's the, it's the mindfulness part that really bothers me at my core. During my master's, so I was studying consumer psychology, right? And I was constantly flooded by papers on how to market really unsustainable products to little children and you know, horrible, horrible things of how to maintain this, this system. And I remember my disgust and I remember thinking, I don't want to be a part of this. And, but then understanding how a lot of people actually knew what was going on and they, and they were fine with it. But I think, I think that's better than being completely at the system's mercy, let's say. So where, again, you don't know what's going on. You feel like you don't have enough money. You don't feel happy. You, you're depressed. You feel alone. You feel unsatisfied, like so many people actually feeling because we're living in a mental health crisis right now. And it's because you don't really understand what is going on. And so you don't understand how to change it, at least for yourself as an individual, right? So the next question I don't think has a right answer, of course, but is there a way, in your opinion, in which we can improve? Because most of the discussion we're having and we had even before recording this was that we need to improve the way we communicate, just in general, about the issue, about the problems, about the solutions, who's doing what, like you were saying, and so on. Like in Italy, we have an author. She wrote a book. She has four kids and she became famous because she picked more sustainable choices, no car, bikes to work, has her kids bike to school, just an example. Uh, She tries to produce as little waste as possible. She keeps track of it as well. And she has the time and I imagine some money to do so, but she's just one example. And she's trying to, to, to push people to do the same, but it's not as easy, of course. She's struggling, what I imagine would be the conversation we're having now. But do you think there is a better way in which we can communicate through the media as well, even to somebody who thinks, I don't have the time, I don't have the money, and I also don't care. Well, honestly, I think that the biggest change that can happen is is a collective one, meaning the country, the government, should actually help us in this. And so the first way that we can actually help in this conversation is by voting. That's definitely the first and best thing that we can do. Voting for green policies, for green parties, 
uh, definitely that. Another thing for sure is that, I don't know if you've noticed, but when there, there are these examples of people who produce zero waste and they're incredibly sustainable, but every time someone uh, listens to that story, or most of the time when someone listens to that story, they say something like, well, yeah, but maybe she has no social life. Or yeah, but, you know, there's always a but. And that's because the sacrifice of living that way is just too much. And so what I think is really important is creating a, a, a social identification with that. And by this, I mean, if, if more and more people actually do that sacrifice, that becomes a social group. And that social group can be a point of reference for a lot of other people and they can identify with that group. And that would create an actual movement. And that's how the, the, the climate change movement actually kind of started, right? And, and, you know, real activists work that way. And so I think that, that definitely, the, the more people start talking about it and the more, and, and, not, and I don't even think there's a, a right way to talk about it. I think it's just really good that people start talking about it, start seeing it as, seeing it as a problem, uh, make it salient in other people's minds. Um, but then again, I think the biggest issue we're facing and, and the best way to act on it is definitely through policies. A, a lot of the research looks at how this big change in, in, in the climate change, change movement and how it became important actually is because of the social aspect. I, I remember reading this paper, like people were more likely to recycle if there was someone else watching them and how it, it is completely a social construct, right? But that's that's kind of the basis of, of how humanity solves problems, right? You don't want to solve a problem alone. Why not, people? If you want to find a solution, go out and recycle with your friends. It's going to be good. Put a live Instagram video. That's maybe a good part about having social media in our hands. Absolutely, yes. Yes, definitely influencers. Letting people know what you're doing, that it's cool doing it. That's a fantastic motivator. The social part of the issue of climate change. It's fundamental for us to actually move on finding a solution or at least kind of trying to solve the problem. We had a question about governments and policies, and that could be our last. Because I would imagine that what you're saying is that we could reassure people that, of course, you cannot solve problems on your own. And that if you did pressure the government locally, nationally, internationally to act, it would be more convenient. And there is, of course, a gap there. How can we reassure people by having them act then as well? And we actually have some research on this, that helplessness is, is a key mediator in the relationship of, between the individual and, and environmental actions, actually. Uh, and so I think what's, what's really important is that even if this is my, my call to action to people listening, I think that the most important thing is that if, if you... Even if you feel overwhelmed, even with all of your emotions and what you think about it and how you feel about it, it's, it's really important that you focus on what you can control and what you can do. Even if it's just a tiny little part and it won't change the world and it won't change, it won't solve the issue of climate change. Just understanding that you as, as yourself, as an individual, cannot solve climate change. I think that would relax people a lot. Uh, and I think that uh, the, the, the little part that each individual can, can take, can do, is to get more information on what it is actually that is killing the planet so that they can understand, so that we can understand what sacrifices are important to us, right? So if I'm not a big fan of meat and I understand that that's a huge CO2 uh, emitter, right, then I, I will stop eating meat. If, however, I am a great fan of meat, I cannot go without it. I can find other ways to help the planet, right? You're not supposed to be perfect. And so many times this, there's this idea that, you know, if, if you're battling against climate change, you need to be the, the perfect, most sustainable person and you need to feel guilty if you're not zero waste. And no, I think that's, that's, a, that's a trap. That's an emotional trap. 
And so what you can control, again, is, is those little things. So definitely get informed on that. And then when there are elections, what your candidates are standing for, and not just the policies that they want to implement, but also the mentality behind it. Because if they do want green policies, but at the same time, they are really pro-business, they really like, they really want to help businesses, huge businesses, I mean, like Amazon type of businesses grow, then there's kind of a mismatch there. And so trying to understand it better, talking about it with your friends, just on how exactly that would work. Um, I think, I think that would be, that is my personal opinion on, on how to, on how to act and what I personally do myself. Thank you for your time, Carolina. I learned something new and I'm sure our audience has too. I am Asia and you listen to Rethinking Climate. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn and Twitter. All our episodes are available on our YouTube channel, so do not forget to subscribe. And tell us, how sustainable do you think you are in your everyday life? Leave a comment down below and thank you for listening. Thank you.